Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you this month's installment of the E4C seminar series. The series is spearheaded by ASME's Engineering for Global Development Research Committee, and its purpose is to intellectually develop the field of engineering for global development. We host a new research institution monthly to learn about their work advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and beyond. Today, we're very pleased to have James Raja Nayagam, the Senior Project Advisor at the Center for Social Innovation and Entrepreneurship at IIT Madras joining us. My name is Yana Aranda. I'm the President of Engineering for Change, and I'll be one of the moderators today, along with our colleague, Jesse, Dr. Jesse Austin Brenneman. The seminar you're participating in today will be archived on E4C site and our YouTube channel. Both of the URLs are listed on this slide. Information on upcoming seminars is available on our site. Uh, E4C members will receive invitations to upcoming seminars directly. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for future topics or speakers, please do reach out to our team at research.engineeringforchange.org. And if you're following us on Twitter today, please join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag. Hashtag E4C Seminar Series. Now, before we move on to our presenter, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization, digital platform, and global community of more than a million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of those may include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to news and thought leaders, insights on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, research collaborations, and more. E4C members also receive exclusive invitations to online and regional events and access to resources aligned to their interests. Please visit our site to learn more and sign up. E4C's research work cuts across geographies and sectors to deliver an ecosystem view of technology for good. Original research is conducted by Engineering for Change research fellows annually on behalf of our partners and sponsors and delivered as digestible reports with implementable insights. We invite you to visit our research page, uh, the URL is listed on this slide, to explore our field insights, research collaborations, and review our State of Engineering for Global Development, a compilation of academic programs and institutions offering training in the sector. You'll also see one of our research collaborations highlighted here is in fact with, uh, one of, um, with IIT for Madras, who we have joining us today, on challenges related to dissemination of sustainable technologies in India. If you have research questions or want to work with us on a project as a research fellow, please contact us at research.engineeringforchange.org. And I'm so excited to actually share a little bit more about our 2020 cohort of East Percy Research Fellows. What you'll see in the slide is uh, our spread of incredible 25 fellows from all around the globe who will be working with us uh, as of now until early fall to conduct ecosystem research and investigate uh, various solutions and deliver those research results for publication online, distribution to our partners and sponsors, and presentation at conferences. We encourage you to check out more information on engineeringforchange.org uh, uh, forward slash e 4 fellowship. Uh, we're really proud of our cohort this year and are always on the lookout for new applicants and new candidates. Now, um, a little bit about uh, housekeeping items. Uh, we would like to give a practice to how we use our Zoom platform. Right now, for those of you who are seeing chat, please type in your location into the chat window, uh, which is located in the bottom right of your screen. If you don't see the chat, just look for the chat icon um, and go ahead and click on that. So I see, all right, we have already folks adding in here. Welcome from Montreal, Canada, Oregon, Ann Arbor, and Germany, Kenya, Birmingham, UK, Chennai, Scotland, uh, lovely, lovely. Welcome, everyone. I am here in New York City. It's, it's really great to see you all here. Welcome. We're thrilled to have you join us. Now, um, 
with respect to the chat window, please do share comments, anything you want to highlight to your fellow attendees in the chat. Uh, for uh, questions that are directed to the speaker, please kindly use the Q&A window, which is also available uh, if you look at the icon with little bubbles. So thank you again for joining everyone. Uh, we are thrilled to have you from all over the world. I'm seeing a lot of excellent uh, uh, feedback here. All right, and with that, I would like to introduce our speaker. Um, James Rajanayaram is a senior project advisor at the Center for Social Innovation Entrepreneurship at IIT Madras. He is a sustainable development expert in the development sector with 14 years of experience in promoting a number of small industries, enterprises, and other nonprofit organizations that provide social welfare, such as health, livelihood, and jobs. His core expertise is in formulating market-based solutions for the development of social welfare indicators. I'm not going to read this very long uh, bio, but I will say that he sits on the board of studies uh, of a number of educational institutions and is a board member of the governing council of an entrepreneurship cell in a private higher institution. Um, he has, as a textile technologist with an MBA in technology innovation management obtained from Germany, He's a multilinguist and a budding writer of short stories and nonfiction. Welcome, James. We're so thrilled to have you. I'm going to now also introduce my uh, co-moderator, Dr. Jesse Austin Brennerman, who's an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Michigan uh, and earned his PhD in mechanical engineering uh, from MIT, as well as SM in mechanical engineering and a BS in ocean engineering at MIT. I'm also not going to read this entire bio, but I'm thrilled to um, have Jesse spearheading these series. With that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to James. So can everyone see the screen? Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, Sienna, for the introduction. And uh, uh, I also thank uh, Engineering for Change for this opportunity to share uh, my knowledge, my experience in the field of uh, technology transfer, particularly in the SDG context, whether it be for agricultural technologies or clean cooking stoves or uh, clean energy technologies. Uh, this is what I'm going to share. Um, and uh, above all, first of all, uh, my thanks to all the participants here for coming uh, for this interactive opportunity. Uh, personally, it's a uh, uh, luxury and I thank uh, this kind of opportunities to interact because nowadays because, uh, uh, since the lockdown it's a luxury to meet and interact with uh, people from all over the world and it gives me uh, immense happiness so again thanks for this opportunity uh, to start with uh, I'm going to focus on this technology dissemination challenge uh, in the SDG context and what I am going to share is specifically from my uh, experience with uh, IIT Madras, particularly with the Center of uh, Social Innovation and Entrepreneurship, where we have, the center has been involved with a couple of other centers. One is uh, uh, Rural Technology Action Group at IIT Madras, and another uh, group is uh, it's, uh, it's a research center, Murupa Chikya Research Center, uh, uh, which is a research organization from the Murugapa group. Uh, so we have been involved in the last couple of years for technology transfer for rural technologies. And uh, uh, we have been quite successful. And there are, of course, challenges which we are, over we are trying to overcome. Uh, particularly the engineering challenge, market challenge, and so on. So I will share mainly those. And of course, I will also share my experience in the VC sector over the last 15 years, where I have had opportunity to interact with a number of faculty from different engineering institutions for developing their products and transferring their technologies to either entrepreneurs so that also I will keep in uh, mind while sharing my experience. Uh, besides that, I will also, a uh, couple of things at the starter is, uh, we are, I'm not going to discuss about uh, technology transfer for industrial applications. So this is not uh, industrial technology transfer, but 
technology uh, transfer for the uh, communities. So uh, the, another difference to note here is unlike uh, technology transfer for industries, here we are talking about which is uh, that one is transactional, but here we are talking about relational technology transfer. How do we build relationship with the communities, with the technologists, and with the entrepreneurs, mostly the development sector, social entrepreneurs, and so on. So this is what I'm going to share. Uh, and my structure of presentation, I'm going to speak about uh, my experience in the next 20 to 25 minutes. I have structured around the uh, overview of all the systems in the technology uh, transfer process, including the actors, the processors, and uh, the users, and so on. And we will talk about challenges in each of the element within this larger uh, framework and at the end i will develop uh, a framework for an effective analysis of uh, breaking down the challenges components of technology transfer process and understand uh, the reasons or successes challenges in each of the element that will help the academicians policy makers uh, technologists and uh, anybody if there are from the development sector on how to effectively ch address the challenge and then disseminate technologies for the benefit of the community and thereby address the sustainable development goals. Uh, finally, I will also speak a couple of minutes about uh, our own center, what we are doing, and then a couple of other initiatives at IIT Madras and in our community on addressing these challenges. So this is what I'm going to speak. Uh, the first slide is the overview where you see uh, the technology dis dissemination. We have actors on one side comprising of uh, technologists, the technology manager from the respective institution, and uh, very often uh, the entrepreneur. So they comprise the actors. I have removed the users which are the core component of the technology dissemination process into separate component because user adoption is for whom we exist and that requires a separate uh, mention. So that's why I have uh, given them a separate uh, element. And then we are looking at the process where we start with the purpose of design. We will look at the development cycle, how, it, how the technology dissemination cycle happens and what are the challenges in it and particularly i am mentioning design for manufacturability which is actually part of the development cycle but which requires mention because this is where one of the areas where most of the technologists they uh, fail to address uh, the manufacturability ease of operation ease of working in the field and finally the negotiation part how do we negotiate uh, technology transfer with NGOs, entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, and so on. User adoption behavior, I, I'm calling it as user, instead of just users, their adoption behavior as an important element because uh, this, is, this will give an idea of how do they, the users, address the benefits with respect to or as opposed to the technologists view the benefits of a technology and so on the ownership because very often the users or it could be individual users such as a farmer or it could be a community ownership like a pond or a water body and finally the cultural fit how does the culture accept or reject a specific technology even though if all other conditions uh, tick go in favor of it so these are some of the elements of user adoption behavior. And the last point is for my own or the, for the purpose of academicians or whoever is involved in the field. Uh, I feel in my personal experience, there is a uh, large wide gap of uh, uh, documentation uh, of the successes, success factors, failures, uh, lessons learned from the 
technology transfer process for uh, the communities for the good so that's why i have added these things so in the next slide uh, uh, we are looking at actors so right from uh, the first point uh, technologists uh, in my interaction either uh, in in the couple of technologies where we have been currently dealing and also in my past experience and of course we did uh, uh, CSIE and the E4C we did a survey which I will speak about later uh, we understand from the various academicians technologies the one of the main components of uh, challenges for them is to uh, lack of connect or uh, the disconnect between the technology and the market technology and the user so these are two important points that each technologist must address uh, before taking it further or be, even before starting a techno, uh, technology development cycle and the third point is very often this is what we hear limited funding for post development i am not saying limited funding for the development cycle but there is a lot of uh, requirements for post development where you need to develop the entrepreneurs mentor them and then make it happen in the field so there is of course a possibility a requirement a challenge for funding scope in post development scenario and next i come to the manager part uh, here manager represents the institution from which the technologist comes very often that when the technology is developed from the technology by the technologies so uh, a manager technology manager within the institution has a responsibility to uh, either uh, disseminate the technology and here i see uh, the challenges or how do uh, whether it's a pull strategy or a put uh, whether to pull the technology uh, pull the users and the entrepreneurs towards the institution and the technologists or push the technology to the user and entrepreneur and whether it is reactive or proactively uh, go to the entrepreneurs and disseminate the technologies and you know managers play a very uh, in crucial role in this connect between man, uh, technologies and entrepreneur entrepreneur the third important actor who takes uh, care of the technology and actually disseminates, commercializes in the field. Um, unlike, again, industrial uh, enterprises, industrial transfers, here entrepreneur is a very loose term that I, uh, I can I, I imagine. Uh, it's not a conventional uh, for-profit or a commercial enterprise. Here, very often, they are rural entrepreneurs, small business owners, um, NGOs, the non-profit sector, or the development sector, or the very recent budding of uh, social entrepreneurs who come with a mission to serve the society. So this is an entrepreneur with a different mindset, with a different requirements, and that's why they require lot of mentoring support funding different kind of funding mechanism for them to take all these products into the market or into the field so these are three important players with each with distinct challenges and when we come to the processes uh, we look at the uh, the purpose of design here again it's the classic uh, dilemma for a um, maybe the design thinking process whether we have a solution and we are searching for a problem or whether we are working the other way around, we identify a problem and then work for a solution. So that's uh, again a classical dilemma which technologists with specific expertise must uh, look at. Uh, then the next one is the development cycle uh, as uh, the development cycle as we address in normal technology uh, technology development process comprising of idea uh, idea prototype development uh, field trial testing uh, commercialization and then uh, market and so on here again it remains the same but there are a couple of changes unlike industries where you have specific uh, uh, 
uh, units for uh, r and d department that works on uh, that that is multidisciplinary multifunctional here we have uh, uh, the research uh, the technologist or faculty from the academic institution he or she works with a constantly changing team comprising of uh, research scholars so research scholars and interested students maybe so that poses a uh, difficulty in terms of continuation of the project of the development cycle and also the time boundedness of the technology development cycle it could be either uh, not so rigid or it could be uh, it could be very elongated uh, scale multifunctional of course because uh, uh, in a purely academic or engineering technological institution the teams may not comprising of may not be comprising of people from either from purchase or from uh, accounts or finance or marketing sales so that it again poses a challenge for efficient uh, uh, technology development or prototype or a minimum viable product so these are some of the challenges and of course very often the design for manufacturability which is again a component of development cycle but which i want to address separately because uh, design for manufacturability implies that uh, many very often the faculty they do stop at the prototyping process and they go and implement in the field and it 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 lacks of uh, it may, uh, very often it may lack of ease of operation for the end user uh, it may lack also safety features and it is built with locally available materials so the availability of these resources and materials these are some of the challenges and the actual uh, the fabrication process for these technologies may not be immediately available and there is no uh, it, um, very often the machines are customized so that presents a uh, challenge for the technologies uh, in terms of design for manufacturability and of course the last one the negotiation where uh, it takes place between the technologist and the entrepreneur it depends on the entrepreneur and the technologist uh, it uh, it's mostly attitudinal which says that uh, very often the technologist may um, uh, uh, particularly i have seen it in uh, grassroots innovators or innovators from the uh, public uh, they have a fixed mindset uh, in terms of opening up their technologies for uh, in for fears of intellectual property and so on so that's again another factor challenge for this uh, process and then uh, coming to this uh, user adoption behavior which is the important component uh, what i would specifically like to address is uh, very often uh, the technologist or the technology is seen as uh, when we address the claims and uh, the benefits we address it from the technology point of view but user looks at a component a sum of what i see uh, what i uh, mention as the benefits of the new technology minus the conversion cost for the users uh, from the existing methods to the new technology and also the benefits and the, uh, the benefits from the substitute methods whatever be it whether it's uh, a locally available substitute or any other uh, any other uh, uh, substitute whether it be chemical or something anything it uh, the total user benefits should exceed the new technology benefits and, and that uh, once that uh, becomes significant then it's easy for the users to adopt new technologies and uh, gain benefits from them and of course the ownership is a uh, is a challenge because uh, uh, the community ownership lack of ownership and therefore uh, lack of uh, maintenance and so on it presents and uh, presents a challenge and the last one the cultural fit that arises from the inequality divide either due to uh, class or uh, 
like any other factor specifically to india the caste and uh, the gender divide and so on that needs to be addressed right into the uh, uh, right into the technology development process and of course this one i need not emphasize um, uh, there is an inadequate uh, or that is a wide gap for uh, documentation uh, this covers the uh, technology transfer overview uh, i will also uh, to summarize again from our own findings which uh, uh, csie was uh, last year it collaborated it guided uh, a couple of fellows from engineering for change to understand the technology transfer challenges in academia so these are some of the reasons barriers that uh, the fellows gained from one to one interviews with uh, people from the faculty from the technological institution and this again captures whatever i have said previously like uh, uh, business disconnect end user disconnect expertise within the team uh, not ex uh, technological expertise but market business expertise and then of course the end user feedback and the funding opportunities from government and various sources so these are again uh, they corroborate our my own experience with uh, uh, what's happening in the field so with all these things i'm trying to give a framework uh, on how to analyze the success factors and uh, how to learn from uh, uh, the technology transfer process for the good for the social good so this explains there are uh, six uh, key parameters that i want to highlight one is the total benefit from the right side which uh, which is an important uh, parameter for the success factor or the failure for technology transfer process and then we have uh, uh, not in that order of uh, priority the market technology and market fit and then problem to solution fit which is again the second part the problem should fit the solution uh, or uh, sorry the solution should should fit the problem uh, and uh, technology market fit how does competition work how do so uh, substitute products uh, compete with uh, with the new offering so this one and then uh, technology with respect to engineering fitness that explains how easy it is the prototype or the technology is for the end user to adopt use and uh, uh, replace so that's where the technology engineering fit is an important parameter and then also we have the technology manager fit how effective is the technology transfer process within the institution and of course and the last point is the technology entrepreneurship or not sorry uh, technology entrepreneur fit where the technologist and the entrepreneur ineffectively uh, they become a team and they remain together to address all the business challenges by through the combination of technology know-how uh, which the technologist bring and uh, brings and the entrepreneur who brings the market knowledge and they effectively address and penetrate the market and reach the end user so this framework i believe will be useful again in my case in the next slide um, i have given uh, uh, listed out uh, uh, seven technologies without each naming uh, the technology and also the faculty or the institution from where it comes from uh, just to uh, be confidential so here or uh, from my experience at CSIE, MCRC, and my previous assignments, these are some of the devices where uh, I have uh, technologies where we have helped, we have uh, 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 tried to uh, transfer through the, with the help of uh, development sector or rural entrepreneurs, and to some extent succeeded. Uh, if you look at uh, the tick marks wherever all the factors except for livelihood machine where the p6 the use of benefits 
uh, at this moment uh, uh, the user benefits do not the total user benefits do not totally exceed the benefits arising out of the livelihood machines but which we are addressing but it's still the project is going on so that's the only area but otherwise wherever uh, when i looked at all these cases wherever all the ticks have been uh, working then the chances of a good technology transfer and the community benefiting out of the technology transfer process has been good and in some in those cases where other fits even though the problem solution fit is there but there is no fit with either the entrepreneur or the market or the benefits the manager and uh, so on if they do not work and then there is a chance of uh, 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 there is a very slight chance of succeeding in the market succeeding in the market and uh, reaching to the users these are seven um, uh, technologies that i can think of and we need to this is where i have been saying we need to bring uh, lots of case studies on where the these the success factors and the failure factors uh, besides that uh, before i wind up i will also talk about uh, the initiatives at csie uh, the center where i represent one of a couple of initiatives where we work is we try to bring technologies either from within iit madras or from other institutions like what we have been doing with mcrc where we identify technologies uh, and then take it to the identify rural entrepreneurs and disseminate and uh, uh, this is one area where we have been working for the last couple of years and we see good opportunities based on these parameters where we could succeed uh, with respect to the technology transfer process other than that i will also mention very specific initiative about uh, the challenge of addressing the market disconnect and user disconnect how iid madras addresses is through one initiative called uh, uh, the uh, center there is a center Uh, which uh, which is called gopalakrishnan deshpande center for innovation which addresses the market disconnect and user disconnect challenge through a unique program called uh, uh, called uh, incubate which uh, in which the faculty who have developed products they are given uh, a time frame in which they go around all over the places to identify talk with understand the users and then come back and say whether i want to pursue or not that's a worthwhile model to emulate uh, for other higher institutions and other groups where faculty could be exposed to the users market and then they come back and start working from problem solution fit and go on so this is where uh, our experience comes in and i would be very happy Uh, to have collaboration uh, with CSIE with IIT Madras for any technology transfer initiative. How do we bring technologies from wherever they are, and then implement, de uh, deploy in our in our rural communities, particularly for the agriculture sector, water sector, clean energy, clean cooking, and uh, of course the livelihood. Uh, so this is i i conclude here and i'll be open to questions later on uh, all these aspects uh, thank you thank you so much james uh um, we can go ahead and you feel free to stop sharing your screen and i'm going to turn it over uh to jesse now to kick us off and i welcome our listeners to put your questions into the Q&A window there's a few right there um so over to you Jesse All right thank you first of all James thank you so much this is a great uh topic to talk about um you know I've been interested in hearing from you since I read your report on uh you know the challenges to dissemination I think many of us recognize uh, when you work in this field that you know the technology is one, one piece of this 
right? So you might have the right technology. And I think in all the cases you mentioned, you have the right problem solution fit, which is generally how we think about, you know, technology development, right? Did we solve the problem? And what you're bringing up is like, hey, there's all these other actors that are part of this space that if you're gonna realize any benefit from your technology, you also need to understand how these actors, what value is for them and how that happens, right? So this is a, a perfect topic um, and, and very excited to hear, you know, you synthesizing your experience into this type of a framework. So uh, there's a question in the Q&A that I'm gonna ask now, but I think in general, um, I think we also all sort of know that there are different types of scenarios or strategies for having an impact. And I believe that your framework is for one in which you have an organization and you're transferring technology through an entrepreneur to the market, right? So you've identified this. So could you talk a little bit about how you think about whether a project is right for this type of framework? So the question that was asked was, you know, an institution manager is essential for the tech transfer to be effective. And I think that, you know, in your experience, the answer would be yes, that's why you posed it. But I assume that's for certain types of projects or certain situations or markets or systems within which you're operating. So maybe you could speak about how you identify like, hey, this project is a good candidate for this type of system. So it's not all projects, right? But what are the types of projects where you say, hey, you know what, let's go with the framework that you just proposed how do you identify that this is the right system slash framework for a particular pro like how do you go about that is it the problem is it the technology is it who's on the team i'm not sure how you identify that this is the, if you were to say me jesse use my framework when should i use it i guess is my question so maybe you speak yeah. a little bit about that sure uh thanks jesse for that uh, yes it is important to know uh which uh which uh, whether I can apply this framework for all situations? Yes, you are right. No, uh, no. in many cases, no, because suddenly there are. Uh, I might have left out uh, 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 the government. Government plays a bigger role of all these things. Government is the biggest uh, social entrepreneur. Uh, they and uh, they disseminate technologies. Uh, in fact, uh, they they have the capability. They have the means. They have uh, all the possible, all the things, resources to disseminate technologies and they can do it. And I have left them out specifically because then it's not just that it's not a technology transfer process. The government's government take it up and then they deploy it. It's a, it could be a, a law. It could be a, 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 it could be just a charitable. So that way, uh, those technologies which are public good, which are uh, community driven, which are infrastructure related. For instance, I have come across, uh, I will quote, uh, which I have not done here, uh, which, but of which I had an opportunity to co-work, uh, which was uh, a, um, effective use of plastic for uh, road building. So that uh, it, uh, uh, to some extent, um, uh, we did try to identify, uh, uh, ident or locate uh, entrepreneurs to see how they can build and then transfer it to, uh, say, uh, highway builders, the road building contractors, and say that ask them to use that. But that did not work in many cases. Uh, 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 that has been slightly successful because certain governments took it up upon themselves and they used the technology offered by this faculty uh, from South India to uh, adopt that technology and build roads which have been good. So public good is one a differentiator, key differentiator is whether this is for, uh, whether this is a clear public good or a private good. And in another case is um, I may also say where uh, uh, again uh, from my own previous assignment the uh, it more or less looked like uh, there was no fit with uh, the entrepreneur and uh, the uh, the technologist and the entrepreneur but in hindsight I see where, uh, that particular innovator we facilitated 
uh, technology transfer with the uh, with an entrepreneur from the US. The entrepreneur came all the way from the US to uh, take this technology and uh, disseminate. But then the on, the innovator said had the courage to say, in spite of very good, in spite of a very good deal, he said no. And at the time we were uh, really very disappointed. But when I look back now, after 15 years or uh, more than probably about 13 years later, I see that has been beneficial to the society. Now I can say confidently, I have been tracking, uh, sorry, uh, tracking the technology. It has spread to all the continents, uh, uh, particularly in Africa, in Asia, in South Asia. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, Europe, but it has been very good, uh, a decentralized model where the entrepreneur or no, not the entrepreneur, the innovator turned entrepreneur became successful and it would might have been a failure if the entrepreneur had taken that particular technology and made it a centralized scalable proposition. So in, um, uh, I would uh, rephrase it in, uh, in, a, in a framework model. If this technology is scalable, then probably it is suited for entrepreneurship based model. But if it is replicable, then it may not. So the that, key words are scalable and replicable. That's a that's a great answer. Thank you for that insight. I think it's it's really interesting. Um, you know, I think this this turns perhaps on the definition of tech transfer, right? So if you think about like how a technology, so you've just mentioned several different pathways that a technology may get to an end user, right? But you're talking about specifically in your framework an entrepreneurial activity. And for you, you look at the technology and say, okay, is this a scalable technology? Is this something a company could make a profit on within a market-based system? Could we then get it up and you know have the benefits outweigh the costs and distribute it that way? Or, and you've said there are other successful models, whether that's a good where it's not possible to make a profit, maybe it's like mosquito nets, right? Where it's like, we just want to get this to everybody because society, it's a public good or roads, the government needs to take a ownership of this and there's a different transfer, tech transfer model, but your framework is specifically looking at these scalable uh, entrepreneurial activities. Yes. Right? Um, <laughs> sorry, this is what happens when you're in quarantine. Uh, <laughs> so the, the next question that we'll have, and then I'm going to mute so I could, I could, I could deal with this. Uh, this question of push versus pull, often we talk about this, but then when we're teaching design, at least uh, within the communities that I've seen in development, we're talking about, okay, code design, really want to identify the, the challenge, but you've talked about, hey, you know, maybe we just come up with a new technology, we have some new physics-based thing, we come up with Teflon, whatever it is that has a lot of new performance, and then I want to go see where that solution is, what, what problem this solution could be good for. So how do you know when it's appropriate? Like, you know, you talked about scalable versus replicable for using this framework. Could you talk about a little bit about how you identify whether technology is like good for, should I go and find a problem for this or should I go look at problems first? So how do you sort of make that choice? What is your thought process uh, around that? Again, uh, uh, I guess uh, we need to, uh, uh, so, okay, sorry. Uh, we hear again the difference is whether it is um, uh, whether it is for the community or for industrial application. In industrial application, a typically a scientist or a technologist develops a new chemical, new formulation, or a new technology, new machinery and then searches for different applications, whether it be the application could be useful in medical technology in the field of medical, or it could be for agriculture. It's again, different applications. So you have a technology, you have a solution, you're looking for different applications. And the application could come from anywhere. The technologist might have developed a product for a specific, um, a specific sector or for application 
but in many cases it might be useful for different applications and this is what typically happens in the defense sector defense or space technologies where many of the technologies developed for uh, space applications or uh, uh, defense applications like uh, improving the shelf life of uh, pre cooked food so they found they found applications in the civilian market later on for when the uh, refrigerated systems developed or when we had the retail sector became a chain of superstores instead of a fresh food market so then we looked at solution and then we looked at the um, applications but here in the case of uh, sustainable development goals or communities the problems are clear in front of uh, somebody to see and the role of technologists or uh, the faculty or anybody involved in the sector is to empathize the problem empathize with the community understand the pain point and use all the engineering and technological skills to develop a solution that fits the requirements of the community it may not be innovative it may not be a complete scientific solution but what we are looking at uh, maybe uh, i can also talk uh, we can also think of frugal innovation where we bring everything together and then give it a solution just to improve the lives of those who are vulnerable communities so that's where i think the difference is yeah that's great so uh, i heard a lot there there's a lot there to unpack um, but just if I was going to try and synthesize it, what I'm hearing is, uh, first of all, I mean, it depends on where it's coming from, right? So if you're in a very sort of highly constrained, like space or defense, uh, and you come up with a new technology that's really, really high performance, whether it's for food or for something else, because you have like a really narrow problem that requires a lot of performance, and you develop like a radical new innovation, then you can start to say, okay, like, hey, let's go see if there are other applications for this among the problems that we know about, right? right? But in general, when we're thinking about development, it sounds like most of the time you're thinking about a market pull type project because you're looking at community level needs and how do we address success really is about addressing some quality of life issue. Um, one of the things that, that uh, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, thinking about your framework was that, Excuse me. I'm, I'm sorry, Louis. Can you, let me just finish this thought, okay? Um, the the frame about the framework was if I'm a technologist, you know, I'm up here in academia. I'm working on this technology. I heard about a problem. I'm working with a community. How do I think about generating evidence that is compelling to the other actors? So when you talked about design for manufacturing, or the tech manager, or the entrepreneur. So if I wanted to go to an entrepreneur and like pitch them on my technology, right? I have to have built up some evidence that says, hey, entrepreneur, this is a good idea for you to spend your time thinking about the technology that I have, right? So how do you go about either making those connections between the different actors, or if you were to give advice to a technologist, I think one of the problems is I might as a technologist say, okay, like, look, I can show you the physics. I've done these lab experiments. Like we've really solved this problem, but that, you know, I haven't talked about profit yet. And maybe the entrepreneur only cares about, okay, well, what's the cost? What's your scalability? What's this? And I haven't, I don't have any evidence for that yet. Right. So could you talk about your experience about managing between communicating between these different actors, right? And that, that's something I would love to hear your experience because you sort of have this overarching view over all of them, right? Uh, I would rather, uh, uh, it's not, uh, I will not share, uh, uh, I would rather give an example of what is done to, understand, uh, to address your question, which is uh, the center which I shared, the GDC Center for Innovation which runs a program for faculty and the research uh, scholars to understand the market first and also the users. So they typically in about uh, six weeks, 
they go all over the places, meet users, talk with them, see if that is a market. And when they come back, they present their findings. And very often, uh, if you uh, look at the statistics uh, from the cohorts that they have been running for the last couple of years, uh, the faculty, they come and they boldly say that our technologies do not fit the requirements of the particular user group. So that understanding comes from enabling a space for these faculty to interact with the market, to interact with the user, which I feel very often the scientists, the researchers, the technologists uh, do not have, or which is not available in the government funding mechanism to go and understand the user, to go and see the problem. So that's where the first point is, um, uh, the more than, yes, of course, there is a problem solution fit, which is what you said uh, rightly, uh, scientists looks at problem solution fit. If that's that, then everything is taken care of, but that's not so. You have some, you have to understand the role of substitute products, the role of competition in the market, the role of the entrepreneur, and this, uh, for that, there is no funding mechanism or uh, any other private funding mechanism does not allow, give you an opportunity to elaborate, to explore other actors. And this is where uh, very often the technologists tell that there is a uh, funding need. And this is what I also believe that you cannot, unlike industrial te uh, technology transfer process, you give the technology and forget. There is a royalty coming in and it's a responsibility of the entrepreneur to take it forward. But here, the, in the case, in our case, the entrepreneur as well as the innovator, they have to be together to understand the market, to understand the user, and then make the user use the product and benefit. So it's upon the technologies to make sure that this reaches the community. Uh, that's a that's a great answer. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think the um, you know it's a really important point. One of the historical challenges I would say uh, when you think about the these markets and having technologists interact in this way is that there's a lack of existing sort of market research, right? So if I was developing something for you know the U.S. market, I could go and pay a company that has already done you know, a lot of that deep understanding, drawing out the insights, they have data on the different existing markets. These people have this much money to pay for this thing. They have this problem. Um, and for many of these, they don't. So you have to, you can't substitute, you can't do it without that, right? So you have to go and either gather that information yourself or gain an understanding by going yourself as you're talking about. And there's often like, well, what's the funding mechanism for that? There's funding if you already have the technology. Okay, great. But how do I pay for you to go out as a technologist and understand this community, understand the need at a deep enough level that you're confident that there's at least a potential market for whatever technology you come up with, right? You can make those design decisions uh, with that perspective in mind. I think that's a really great point and something that we should be looking to build on as a community is how do we create those spaces? How do we create those opportunities for technologists to really understand understand the market so you know i'm glad you guys are doing that at, at csie i mean that's great we have somebody out there doing it um and, and we just want to try and replicate that and get more of that within the community i think it's a really great point um i know we're almost out of time so i want to make sure that anyone has uh final questions for for this we're seeing a lot of thank yous to you uh for this uh talk for the great presentation and i think it's a key issue um, that we've brought up here around thinking about the other actors. Okay, you have a technology, great, but how do we get that to market? And you have to think about that while you're developing the technology, right? You can't, can't do it like, okay, I have the technology, now let's go. It's like, no, we have to, while we're doing it, make sure and be checking and validating all of these things. So I think that's it's really great stuff. Um, I had one last question that I'd like you to answer. Uh, which is, I want to specifically think about working within different systems, right? And uh, you brought up design for manufacturing or cultural fit, you know, all these other factors that you've identified, which I thought was really great. What I'd like to hear about is specifically manufacturing. You know, in the U.S., we have a manufacturing process, depending on what size or scale you want. 
you know, I send my drawings, I say, here's the quote, you know, I give it to them, they send it back to me, they're like, we can make a thousand by this date, whatever, right? And I think that my experience in other systems is like, you have to go and say, okay, well, what processes are available, right? What can you do? What is the level to like, what are the tolerances you can hold? And there's the back and forth where I actually have a different type of conversation with a manufacturer when I'm in Thailand than I do when I'm at, with a shop in the US, right? Um, yeah. and, and they're telling me, well, what if we did it this way because we think we can hold better tolerances if we manufactured it this way? Right. And like, we understand what you want. So we do this. So can you talk a little bit about navigating these different systems and how you think about those things? Um, I guess I will be limited because of my knowledge of other manufacturing systems in the world, just as you mentioned, the manufacturing system in the US and the Thailand. But what I will try to say from my own uh, uh, perspective is, uh, uh, probably India, uh, the concept of frugal innovation originated from India, I guess, uh, if there is no other uh, theory, uh, where the each innovator or the small business owner, they modified the existing versions of available resources, they put together the uh, available resources and developed the mechanism which worked, which addressed the functional aspect of the user, the functional aspect of that particular technology. But what I mean by design for manufacturability is uh, not just, of course, it needs to address the functional aspect of the technology, which is to say that it has to have so many uh, tolerances, efficiencies, input, output, uh, uh, inputs, outputs, uh, components, and so on. But where we are lacking or where uh, the technology developed in a community-based system or for the vulnerable groups of uh, society is these technologies need to come with more than the functional aspect but other aspects such as ease of availability of raw materials for producing those technology or the machinery, uh, availability of resources, which are uh, which could handle that uh, technology, say inputs, and then uh, safety aspects. To uh, you know, for instance, very often it could be the women who are using a specific technology. It could be a agricultural technology or a biomass based conversion technology. Women are, uh, as you know, as you have traveled in the uh, in the Indian uh, farm. Uh, rural farms, it's mostly women who are employed in the sector and for them it needs to be designed for uh, for those people, for those users. So that means how easy, is, how easy it is to operate, how safe it is for the women or for those groups to operate. These features are not addressed and it also uh, uh, it's also uh, unlike uh, there may be uh, in other countries where i'm not uh, yeah, there was ex a very good um, uh, small mechanical manufacturing processes but here it has to be customized different ways of customizing using available raw materials available technologies it could be uh, sources of electricity and so on. So that's where uh, the design for manufacturability needs to be considered in uh, this particular context for uh, for a better adoption rate. Wow, that's so great. Uh, and thank you for sharing those insights. Uh, I'm gonna now, James, because we're, we're really out of time, and although I have many, many more questions, um, I wanna give you a special thank you personally because I feel like I learned a lot um, I also want to say that, you know, in our, in our prior discussion, uh, you had mentioned, you know, if people, we, we have your stuff, uh, your contact information. So if people have further questions, either reach out to myself or, or directly uh, to James. I'm going to hand it off to Hiana to, to, to wrap it up. But again, just a personal thank you for me. Uh, super interesting and really valuable for my, for my learning.
much bigger than that. <laughs> Apparently, uh, Jesse, sorry that your your kiddo doesn't think <laughs> you need to say anything more. Uh, but I appreciate uh, keeping you on time. Uh, James, thank you so much for spending some time with us. I found it deeply insightful. And um, I think CSIE has uh, such a great um, model for us uh, to consider as, as we evolve the sector at large. And um, you noted kind of the hyper-local context and the need to understand that and the need to invest in, in continuing those investigations. And um, I think it's, it's really a good reminder to all of us about what it takes uh, to succeed effectively and to achieve sustainable development through the use of technology. So um, thank you for everyone's questions. Uh, I want to give a plug to our uh, July presenter, Dr. Jeff Walters, who is an assistant professor for civil engineering at George Fox University. He'll be talking quite a bit about WASH, energy, food, and engineering education at large. So we're really excited to have him join our conversation next month. Do sign up for that seminar if you're interested. And uh, thank you to everybody. Uh, I know we're out of time and I wanna be respectful of that. If we didn't tackle your questions, please do send them along to us. If you didn't catch uh, the contact for James, you can, you're always welcome to send it to our team and we'll be sure to direct uh, those questions to him. Thank you everyone, enjoy your day, stay safe, wash your hands, and we'll catch you on the next E4C seminar. Thank you, Yana. And, thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for your time, people.